This is Bill Goodwin speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap. Well, it's Tuesday night again, time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, their guests, the Arkansas traveler Bob Burns, Jimmy Cash, and Paul Whiteman and his music. And now meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, the Burnses are getting ready to leave for New York to entertain the soldiers in some of our Eastern Army camps. Right now, they're in the middle of packing, and suitcases are scattered everywhere. In fact, George hasn't seen so many bags since the last meeting of the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. <laughs> Gracie, we're only going to be in New York three weeks. Do we need all these suitcases? Yes, dear. Now, this little bag has things we'll need on the train, like toothbrushes, your razor, my cold cream and perfume... Your little underwear, my hand... Well, wait, hand- on the train. Oh, well, I just put that on top so the bottles won't rattle around and get broken. <laughs> Look, honey, I'll be embarrassed. Every time we want to get something out of the bag, we'll have to drag out my long underwear. No, we won't. Your underwear has the cutest little door right in the back. <laughs> well, never mind. Gracie, the long underwear, out, out. Take it out. Out? Out, out, out. Now... What did you pack in the trunk? Oh, let's see now. In the trunk, I have your suit, my dresses, Blanche Morton's trombone, your shoes. Blanche Morton's <laughs> trombone? Yes. We're taking that to New York? Uh-huh. Blanche gave it to me along with a book of instructions. Oh, fine. I can't sleep on the train anyway, so at night I'll just practice on the trombone. <laughs> and envy all you lucky people who can sleep. Oh, yes, yes. I must thank Blanche for that. Oh, don't thank Blanche. Thank her husband. Mm. He made her get rid of it. It almost gave him pneumonia. How could a trombone give pneumonia? Likes to practice in bed. And when she stretches it out, it keeps pushing the covers off him. <laughs> <laughs> the trombone comes out. Out of the bag. Out? Out, out. Oh, oh, my darling little ducky. Are you happy you're going to New York, Herman? Oh. <laughs> well, that's nice. You've never been on a train before, Herman. How do you think you'll sleep? <laughs> well, I hope you do. We'll fix a nice little bed for you in the baggage car. What? You'll sleep in the baggage car. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, darling. But there are only two birds. I sleep in one and your daddy sleeps... Oh. Oh, George. Oh, no, I don't sleep in the baggage car. We shouldn't take that silly duck with us anyway. <laughs> go on, go on, go oh, on. Boy. Now come upstairs with me, Herman. I'll pack your rubber fish. Yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to see that Don Duck ride in the dining car under a blanket of wild rice and sweet potatoes. <laughs> Hi, George. Boy, the suitcase is heavy. Phew, say. What have you got in there? Well, just a pair of socks. <laughs> that's a pair of socks? Well, that's all the clothes. Then there's 489 bars of Swan, the new white floating soap. <laughs> it's purer than the finest Castile's, a regular suds and whiz, George. B- Bill, I'm sure they have Swan soap in New York. Oh, well, you see, I'm leaving most of it in Missouri. Missouri? Well, you see, Missouri is the show-me state, so I've arranged to show them. When we get to Kansas City, we'll be met by six beautiful girls carrying six beautiful dishpans of warm water. Oh, no. Now, quick as a flash, I drop a bar of swan into each pan, and I invite the passers-by to step up and wash their dishes. Oh, yes. Everybody in Kansas City carries dirty dishes with them. <laughs> well, now, Can't George... Can't walk down the street without bumping into a fellow with a casserole on his head. <laughs> uh, George... You feel uh... naked unless you've got a soup plate under your arm. Well, you see, George, I've arranged for that. Mm. Ben Bart, who runs the cafe across from the station, is sending the dish pans and the dishes. So then we show him how great Swan is for washing the dishes. Show him how it suds faster than other white floating soaps. And tell him that since Swan is purer than the finest Castiles, it's kind to your hands. So it's great for every soap and water job in the house. Look, the demonstration is out. We won't have time to get off the train in Kansas City. Oh, George. Gee, Ben Barth will bring all those pans down from his cafe. You don't want old Ben to be left there holding his pans up. <laughs> Bill, you're not taking 489 buzz of swan to New York. Well, okay, George. Oh, listen, I've got it. We'll break them all in two and you can take half. Swan breaks in two with an easy twist of the wrist, you know. 
So you can use half in the kitchen for dishes and cleaning and the other half in the bathroom for your hands and face. Look, Bill. Oh, hello, Bill. Oh, will you drop by and pick up Tootsie Sagwell's suitcases? She's all packed. Tootsie, is she going with? Oh, sure. When she heard that we were going around to army camps to entertain the soldiers, you couldn't hold Tootsie back. I wonder what those soldiers will think when they see Tootsie. They'll think Sherman was right. See you later. <laughs> well, this trip is getting more and more uninteresting. Well, that's probably Bill again with more soap. You talk. Good morning, Mrs. Burns. Oh, oh, good morning, Mr. Postman. How are you feeling today? Solid, Mrs. Burns, solid. <laughs> My doll and I went to the Palladium last night to frolic with the rest of the cats. Really? Yes, now I'm a hep jack from way back. Well, I'm certainly surprised. I've never thought of you as a jitterbug. Oh, I've got rhythm. Mr. Fine, I find. <laughs> I can I can Well, that's very pretty. Thank you. Well, have you got any mail for me this morning? Yes, there's a letter here for your husband. I guess it's a fan letter. It's addressed to Mr. Burns, the radio comedian. Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Postman. Goodbye, Mrs. Burns. Remember, keep smiling. <laughs> George would be thrilled to get a fan letter. I was when I got my first one. Oh, George! Uh, I guess he's busy. I'll open it and see what it says. <clears throat> Van Buren, Arkansas. Dear Mr. Burns, I have sold an egg and a pound of butter from the farm, and it bring me enough money to come to California. <laughs> when I get there, we will be married. A 20-year engagement is long enough. Yours very true, Zelda Swinely. Zelda... Engaged? Why? The nerve of that George Burns. All the time he's been married to me, he's been going steady. Why, if I thought for one uh, minute... Well, that... sweetheart, we're all set for New York, honey. Everything is packed. Mm, don't you honey me, you wolf. Huh? <laughs> what? Yeah, I know all about you and Zelda Swinely. Zelda Swinely? <laughs> I never heard of her. Oh, how can you lie like that? I have a letter from her right here. She says she's coming to California to marry you. To marry me? Zelda Swine? Oh, no, let me tell you something, George Burns. You are a beast. If I had to do over again, I wouldn't marry you if my life depended on it. You're the worst husband in the whole world. And if that Zelda Swinely thinks I'm going to give you up without a fight, she's crazy. Oh. <laughs> this is Paul White. A dozen years ago, everyone was singing a tune called As Time Goes By. And now it's the theme song of Warner Brothers' great picture, Casablanca. And everyone's singing it again, including the six hits and a miss. You must remember this, a kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. And when two lovers woo, they'll say, I love you. On that you can rely. No matter what the future brings as time goes by. And love songs never out of date Heart full of passion, jealousy and hate Woman needs man and man must have his mate That no one can deny It's still the same old story A fight for love and glory A case of do or die the world will always welcome lovers as time goes on. 
I say, won't you listen? I'm telling you for the 50th time, I don't know any Zelda Swinley. You do, too. I don't. You do, too. I don't. You do, too. Gracie, I give you my word of honor, I swear I don't know Zelda Swinley. Honest? Honest. You do, too. Oh. <laughs> Gracie, I'm it's telling no you. No use, George. We've come to the parting of the ways. I'm leaving you bread and beard, or whatever they call it. Gracie, if you No, only... George, no, this is the end. I'm going up to my room. Oh, by the way, here's the letter from your girlfriend. I opened it by mistake. Goodbye, George. Gracie, will you please? Uh, well. Say, wait a minute. This letter is postmarked Van Buren, Arkansas. This is Bob Burns. Gracie! Oh, Gracie! Oh, she wouldn't believe me anyway. I'm going over and get that Bob Burns and have him straighten this out. Well, if it ain't my old friend George Burns. Gee, I'm glad to, I'm glad you're home, Bob. Come on in, George. What's on your mind? Well, I'm in trouble, Bob. Gracie thinks another woman wants to marry me. Oh. <laughs> Doggone, if that ain't the funniest thing I ever heard. Now if, <laughs> now, if that was me the gal was after... It is you. Huh? Yeah, she got our names mixed up. She's after you. Oh, now, wait a minute. This is serious. I thought you'd change your tune. Uh, who is this here misguided female, George? Her name is Zelda Swinley. Zelda Swinley? Gosh, I ain't thought of her in years. Oh, then you know her, huh? Yeah, yeah, Zelda come from one of the finest families in Van Buren. Her, her mama was a social climber. She was always holding coming out parties for Zelda. I remember Zelda come out three times, but public opinion always forced her back in. <laughs> Bob, all I want to know is, were you engaged to Zelda Swinley? Well, now, there was a kind of a romantic custom down home. You know, during huckleberry season, everybody went out picking, and if a fella dropped a huckleberry in a girl's bucket, that meant they was engaged. <laughs> well, what I want to know is, yeah, Bob... But I was pretty sophisticated in them days, and, mm. well, I was what you might call Van Buren's Adolf Monju. Mm. <laughs> you know, I was the only one in town that ever done much traveling. You see, one cold winter morning, my hands while I was milking the cow... And you know that cow run away and dragged me clean to the outskirts of Little Rock? All the way to Little Rock, huh? Oh, I've traveled all over the country that way. <laughs> now, Bob. That's the truth, George. Why, to this day, I don't feel at home on a streetcar unless I'm hanging on four straps. <laughs> Look, Bob. What about Zelda Swinley? We... Now, well, sir, now about Zelda. I figured a man of the world like me didn't have to pay no attention to that romantic custom. So I went right ahead and dropped a huckleberry in her bucket anyhow. That's all there ever was between us. Well, okay, okay. Now listen to me. Gracie thinks Zelda is my girl, and you've got to come over and straighten me out. Well, gosh, George, why didn't you say so sooner? You've just been standing there like a dummy. Yeah, I'm a big tongue-tied dope. Well, get your hat, Bob. Poor Gracie is probably having hysterics by now all alone in that house. Hmm. So he's back again, has he? Well, I... Oh. Uh, yes, miss? Is this sure the place where Mr. Burns lives at? Well, yes, yes. Uh, won't you come in? Well, I guess I better introduce myself to you, ma'am. My name is Zelda Swinley. You see, oh, I... Oh, yes, yes. I know who you are. You are the... the other woman. No, I ain't, lady. I'm me. <laughs> I mean that you and I are rivals, Zelda. You... You're fixing to marry Mr. Burns, too? Oh, I'm not fixing. I'm fixed. <laughs> now, let me get this straight. Are you trying to tell me you're already married to that low-down skunk? <laughs> Please, Zelda, you're speaking of the skunk I love. <laughs> Maybe so, ma'am, but I've seen him first. Well, you may have seen him first, but I'm married to him. Won't you give him up, Zelda? No, ma'am, I made up my mind to marry Robin, and you can't talk me out of it. Robin? Well, my husband's name is George. Isn't your husband the fella on the radio they call Bob Burns? Oh, my goodness, no. We're talking about two different people. Oh, I'll certainly have to apologize to George. How could I think that another woman wanted him? 
Then your husband ain't the Burns, I'm Burns. That's right. You're getting the Burns, but not mine. Mine is the good-looking one. Yours is the clever one. <laughs> Jimmy Cash with an up-and-coming tune, Roseanne of Charing Cross. This is a story of love and town. Love is a principal theme. All the story revolves around the girl, myself and my dream. Roseanne of Charing Cross. Bright Roseanne of Charing Cross, dressed in your uniform of white, there by my lonely bed, a lovely angel stopped and said, that's lonely thunder overhead, and that's how we met. Don't you worry your head about it, Zelda. I'll get that Bob Burns over here and see to it personally that you have a lovely wedding. You sure are a kind-hearted woman, Mrs. Burns. Oh, well, it's really nothing. Women should help each other whenever they can. You know what I always say? Judy's sister and the O'Grady lady are under the colonel's skin. <laughs> That's mighty clever saying, I reckon. Well, I- I'll get right on the telephone. Uh, oh, wait. My husband's coming up the walk now, and Bob Burns is with him. Oh, be still my heart. Can I see him too, Mrs. Burns? No, not before the wedding. Well, how come not? Why, it's bad luck. Uh, on the day I married George, my mother told me I'd have bad luck if I saw him before the wedding. What did she say after the wedding? <laughs> well, what should I do? Oh, well, you hide in the other room, and the minute he's ready to marry you, I'll call you. All right, ma'am. <gasps> my, isn't this romantic? I feel just like Cupid, only better dressed. I see. I brought Bob Burns over to clear up that Zelda Swanee situation. Go ahead, Bob. Well, you see, Gracie, George ain't to blame because... Oh, I know that, Bob. You're the man Zelda's going to marry. Gracie, Bob hasn't seen Zelda for 20 years. Yeah, you see, Gracie, things are done different down in Arkansas than they are in Hollywood. Down in Arkansas, people get married who don't hardly know each other. But here in Hollywood, well, I guess it ain't so different after all. (laughs) I'll bet you're anxious for the wedding after being engaged for 20 years. Engaged? Oh, now, wait a minute, Gracie. All I ever done was drop a huckleberry in Zelda's bucket. Ah, well, <laughs> now, don't be nervous at the wedding, Bob. Of course, most men are. Uh, but they ain't going to oh, be... Oh, George was shaking so much that his garter came undone right in the middle of a ceremony. And he had to hook it back on. Well, Gracie, and, I... And when we left the church, he didn't realize he'd hooked it on the wrong leg until he dragged a bridesmaid halfway up the aisle. <laughs> Gracie, Bob is not interested, and we're leaving for New York in an hour. Mm, I envy you getting married, Bob. Yeah, but I ain't Honeymoons don't... are so romantic. I'll never forget mine. We went to our hotel, and for three hours, George sat on one side of the room, and I sat on the other. Look, you don't have to. Finally, he looked at his wristwatch, and it was 12 o'clock. And he got up, and he walked over to me, and he said, Gracie, we shouldn't behave like strangers. How about a game of checkers? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that, that that's mighty romantic. Oh, but... And I want to be the first to give the happy couple a present. You wait here, Bob. I've got something upstairs you adore. George, if they ever ask you to talk, you got to get Gracie a C card. <laughs> yeah, she gets kind of wound up. Yeah, I guess there's only one person in the world can out-talk Gracie. That's my Aunt Gabby Hink. That, that's my talking aunt. But she has an advantage. She could carry on two conversations at once. Well, how could she do that? Well, Aunt Gabby had a loose upper plate that clicked when she talked. <laughs> you know, George, she could recite the Gettysburg address while her teeth clicked out. The boy stood on the burning deck in Morrisville. <laughs> Yeah, but here I am talking when this is my chance to get out of here. So long, George. Goodbye, Bob, and thanks for everything. Hello, George. Where's... Well, Bob Burns. Hello, Bob. How are you? Fine, Bill. Say, look, I'm in kind of a well, hurry. Say, I've been wanting to see you, Bob, to talk over old times down in Van Buren. Yeah, well, right now, you see, I got... Well, to... Bob, do you remember old Hank Borum down there in Van Buren? Bill, some Remember other he time. lived in a white house, Bob? Yes, sir, that house was as white as a bar of swan, Bob. The new white floating soap that's purer than the finest Castile's. Money can't buy a pure soap. Yeah, yeah, but I don't recall him, Bill, but... Uh, oh, so Bob, I... you remember Hank Borum. No, I... Oh, uh... he's married to Nellie Gooch, the crouch stomper from Bixby. <laughs> remember? They have 17 children, and they bathe... <laughs> they bathe every single one of them with swan, Bob. Oh, no. Swan is great for bathing babies, you know. It's kind even to a baby's tender skin. So you know it must be great for your hands and face, your tub, or shower. Hey, Bill, Bob has got to get out of here. Gracie's trying to get him married to a woman from Arkansas. Oh, a woman, huh? Well, let me tell you something about women, Bob. <laughs> women have long considered Castile soaps the standard of purity. But Swan is even purer than the finest Castile. Bob, you grab him by the head and I'll grab him by the feet. Hey, hey, let go of me, fella. Oh. Let me down. Oh. Hey! Well, that's that. So long, George. Oh, what? Bob! Well, here we go again. Look, Bob, I, I said I was going to give you and Zelda a wedding present, and I am. Here, Bob, and our best wishes to you both. Well, now, Gracie, if that ain't the prettiest present... Yes, sir, I always did want one of those. This one sure is a beauty. What is it? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Mama gave it to us for our wedding present. Well, thank you, Gracie. Whenever I eat off of it or wear it or whatever you're supposed to do with it, I I'll think of you. Say, what are them things rattling around in the bottom of it? Oh, well, just some slices of stale bread. I thought for a few days it might be a toaster. Well, whatever it is, uh, I wouldn't be without it. And now I think I'll be running along. Oh, no, Bob. You can't go until you've said you'll marry Zelda. But, Gracie, uh, I couldn't uh, Bob, marry you. Bob, Bob, could I speak to you a minute? Well, sure, George. Pardon us, Gracie. Look, Bob, that Zelda is in Arkansas, and you'll never see her. Now, if you want to get out of here, you better tell Gracie you'll marry her. Well, I guess you're right. Okay, it's a deal. Swell. Hey, Gracie, I guess I've been acting kind of silly. My love for Zelda was buried so deep in my heart, I didn't know it was there. But George just brought it out with a kind of a verbal Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> Why, I'd marry little Zelda right now if she was here. Well, she is. Oh, Zelda. I'm coming, ma'am. Doggone that huckleberry. <laughs> uh, Zelda, uh, Mr. Burns agreed to marry you. Aren't you happy? I don't know. I never dreamed that 20 years would change Robert Burns from a nice-looking young fella until this here broken-down critter. Oh, no. No, Zelda, that isn't Rob, my husband. <laughs> You mean to tell me that this other feller's Bob Burns? Well, yes, of course. Well, in that case, I'd rather have your husband. Oh, Zelda. George and Gracie will be right back, so I'm just going to remind you women how tremendously important it is to save your waste kitchen fats. You should be able to collect at least a tablespoonful of waste fats and grease drippings every day from your baking, roasting, and frying. 
Now put it into a clean, smooth-topped can, and when you've got a pound, take it to your butchers. Within 21 days, your waste fats will start going into munitions. Remember, when you throw away one tablespoonful of waste fat, you're throwing away two rounds of anti-aircraft ammunition. So don't help Hitler. See your waste kitchen fats. Well, here they are, George, Gracie, and Paul Whiteman. Well, kids, thrilled about going to New York? You bet, Paul, and we're especially thrilled about the concert you're going to give at Carnegie Hall March 16th. Oh, and we're especially, especially thrilled because I'm going to play the piano. Gracie, you're not going to do any such thing. The idea is ridiculous. But, George, I wrote a wonderful slogan to advertise my appearance. You wrote a slogan, Gracie? Well, yes. The best tunes of all moved to Carnegie Hall. Uh, you wrote that? Yes, I heard it on the radio and I sat right down the and road. And wrote it. <laughs> Gracie, you can't do that slogan. Oh. Well, here's another one. How's this? That concert of Gracie's won't come from Macy's. Uh-huh. Gracie, you're not going to play in Carnegie Hall. Oh. Well, I've got another slogan. She won't play the cymbals on the third floor at Gimbal. Gracie. And here's another one. Gracie will play, folks. and that Good ain't night. me. Hey, Good hey. Night. The makers of Swan, the new white floating soap, join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in to your CBS station again next week, same time, when we'll be in New York with our special guest, the lovely Madeline Carroll. Now remember George Burns and Gracie Allen, CBS next Tuesday night. And don't forget to listen to Swan's other show, Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou, over another network next Friday night. And now till next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying... See you in New York, and well, I, Swan, how about you? This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>